Uh, hello everyone and good evening and it's a great pleasure to have you all in this special episode of speaker series. I'm super excited. Uh, so basically speaker series is a series of virtual sessions that happens every Friday. So it is hosted by DC cap an e-commerce agency based out of uh, California. We also have an office space here in Chennai. The ultimate aim of speaker series is to bring in thought leaders and change makers to share their experience uh, through a virtual session. We started uh, this session during the begin of, beginning of COVID-19 lockdown because we wanted to keep the working community busy and we want to see this as a way to continuous learning. Uh, that said, this is a special episode in the speaker series. So it's been a 10 episode, I was hosting it. And uh, this is completely close to my heart because of this, uh, because of the speaker of the day. So it's an episode that's exclusively dedicated to college going students and for the budding entrepreneurs. And I could see like a lot of participants who are joining here or the students across. And uh, no, like all you have heard about uh, Imagine Cup, all right? So uh, when you when you have heard the news of Tamil Payan from Hong Kong winning the Imagine Cup, so I was super excited. I was following it. I was watching it. So I was getting in connection with Ajit through LinkedIn, and uh, I was super excited when I got to know like he knows Tamil, and we thought why not bring him here and introduce him to the student community out here in Tamil Nadu. So that we that made the session. So that is why like we're gonna have a interactive session with Ajit and uh, as a few of you know Microsoft Imagine Cup like is an Olympics for student competing in a technology playground it's very similar to the college project that you might be doing now or have done in the past but on much larger scale you got to compete with students from the whole world across the globe so imagine the pressure and the skills needed so I believe like Ajit would have gone through that. And all that said, I'm thrilled and pleased to have Ajit Krishna Namakal Raghavendra from Team Halo, the uh, world champion Microsoft Imagine Cup 2020. So I can see that uh, around like 30 plus students from the various colleges have joined the session and looking forward for more to join. And, uh, and again, a very big hi to the uh, student community out there. And this session is going to be a kind of an interactive Q&A section. Uh, Ajit will be sharing his story and we'll be, asking him, we'll be asking him a few questions. And also we have a special section in this webinar and where we'll be having our uh, CEO, we'll be asking some intriguing questions to Ajit. So that will be benefited for you as well, I believe. And if you have any questions, you can tag them in the Q&A section in the bottom panel in the Zoom application. So Ajit will answer those questions after the initial presentation. And without further ado, let's hear from Ajit on how he and his team won the championship among 28,000 students across the globe. And I believe like Microsoft Cup is the most, uh, okay, let's go through the uh, sections of this webinar. So initially we'll be having a presentation from Ajit Krishna on the Imagine Cup journey and the product Halo roadmap. And post that, we'll be having a fireside chat with Ajit Krishna along with a special guest of the session. And post that, we'll, Ajit will be answering your live Q&A. Okay, so, uh, so all that said, over to you, Ajit. And thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Thanks, Richa. Yep. So, so let me actually move first. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you here. And um, okay, so before uh, talking about the Holo, like I would like to know more about the Imagine Cup. So Microsoft Imagine Cup is the most prestigious competition for young innovators and aspiring entrepreneurs across the globe. And it provides students with a great platform, I would say, to showcase not just their innovation, but their confidence and determination and the team effort. So winning Imagine Cup is not a cakewalk. It takes a whole lot of grit, dedication, and working extremely hard on your idea. Uh, can you please elaborate on the journey and the phases and the levels of competition you have involved yourself? Mm. Yeah, so um, the Imagine Cup journey was actually quite long. 
we started in about November and we applied online. Um, Hong Kong didn't have the regionals uh, here be because uh, the, the local competition here, but we did have the online competition. So we applied online and um, we were chosen as the top 10 in Asia. And that was around February. So at uh, February, we were chosen as the top 10 teams in Asia. And similarly, top 10 teams were chosen from Europe, uh, Middle East and Africa. And similarly also in Americas. So um, of those 10 teams from each region, two get picked as the world finalists. And um, after we delivered our presentation, uh, we were pleased to know that we were chosen as the world champion. So no, no, world finalists. And then when we went to um, the world finals, before that, there was a lot of training. Um, we had a lot of mentorship and we trained our pitch. And on the day off, um, all six teams that were chosen in the end competed and uh, of which three teams got chosen to uh, do the five minute pitch. So the, the process on the day off is that they have a one minute elevator pitch to the judges and three, the top three teams get picked. Then the three teams have another five minute pitch where we um, share ideas and we get, and then we get chosen. So we went through all of those selection rounds where, which was very competitive. And then on, on the final day, we got chosen as world champions. So that's great. Uh, no? So before moving on to the hurdles, so I just want to uh, you know, ask from the participant, like how many of you are closely uh, you know, watching the Microsoft Imagine Cup or closely following the Imagine Cup? Obviously like if S yes, like probably you can use the rice hand um, tab in your bottom panel. Okay, cool. So, okay. Um, okay, so um, can you please take us through the whole of like, you know, the mental health app, uh, Ajit, like uh, what is all about and uh, the way through the Imagine Cup, you no? Know, so that made you to won the championship. Can you please take us through that? Yeah, got it. I'll share my screen. Yes, so, uh, hi, yep, I'm presenting by Hollow. Um, our mission is that we're articulating your mental health. And as you might be familiar, mental health is a big problem, uh, as even you might know some people suffering from mental health, uh, mental health problems. And the current system has a lot of um, gaps where patients don't know what um, don't know what mental health problems they're facing. And the therapists and NGOs have a very time consuming process to figure out what those problems are. So um, what we're working on is we're trying to support um, mental health um, detection and intervening early. And we do this through technology and data oriented perspectives. And we try to make it as simple as just recording, reviewing, reacting. Um, first, we start, you, we start by asking you to record a quick and easy assessment. Um, we back this by research. Um, actually, we combine facial recognition with the gold standard of clinical testing. And then we move on to help, helping you review. So we help you assess your goals and whether or not you're meeting them. And we present this, all of this in a very easy to understand visual based dashboard. And in the end, we even give you a chance to follow up and um, provide personalized programs for self care. And this is so that you can actually work on, um, you can work on your problems by yourself, or we can actually connect you to mental health professionals. Um, what we provide to professionals is that we give them the tools they need to support their practices like case management, administrative processes. And with this, uh, we, we use all of this combined to really help you articulate your mental health. Okay, great. Thank you, Ajit, uh, for this uh, wonderful, you know, uh, thank you for taking us through the whole product as such. 
I know like it is amazing, you know, like uh, there are a lot of social problem which prevails in the society when you take up the mental health problems, the predominant problem in the social which is not shared across much. So that's completely amazing. So, um, so jumping on to the next section, like, uh, so as I said, like we have a fireside chat with Ajit Krishna. So, so like we're going to have Karthik Chidambaram, a founder and CEO of DC Cap, a digital commerce agency. So we'll be having an, um, a good conversation with Ajit and uh, he have like intricate questions. So that will benefit the participants as well. Um, Thank you so much, Karthik, for uh, giving your valuable time uh, for appearing in our um, speaker series for uh, for this fireside chat section. Over to you, Karthik. All right. Thank you, Srija. And uh, hello, Ajit. Uh, thank you. And great to see you again. And uh, first off, before we start, I just want to say a big thank you to everyone who registered. We have great attendance for this uh, event. And uh, we also have a lot of students uh, joining in and uh, we see people still signing on. So that's actually uh, really awesome and it's very encouraging, right? So it's awesome to see the student community uh, dial in to listen to you, Ajit. So again, uh, we are super excited uh, to have you join us. And uh, so Srija mentioned that you're from Hong Kong, right? So when did you move to Hong Kong? And uh, yeah, can you just talk about your early years? Yeah, so actually I was in Hong Kong since I was three years old. We moved here um, due to schooling, actually. I was originally in Taiwan in my very childhood infancy years. Um, but then due to schooling and my parents wanted English schooling. So we moved to Hong Kong and I've been there. I've been here ever since, actually. So all my schooling, um, my education has all been in Hong Kong, really. That's awesome. And Srija also mentioned about your uh, Tamil Nadu connection. So, and it's very nice that uh, your origins are from Tamil Nadu, right? So, Tamil Nadu is very nice, right? Yes, it's very nice. It's a little bit. I'm going to learn a little bit. Okay. It's a little bit. It's a little bit. It's a little bit. Super nice. Cool. Awesome, Ajit. You know, that's great, right? So, it's really nice uh, that uh, right from Tamil Nadu, you moved to Hong Kong and traveled the world and uh, won the Imagine Cup. It makes all of us proud. And um, you know, so I was also reading a little bit about some of your other teammates on the Imagine Cup or the co-founders, right? So looks like you found Cameron, uh, who's your other uh, friend or co-founder or teammate for this Imagine Cup. Can you walk us through that journey? How did you actually uh, find Cameron? I mean, you found him through a mutual friend. And mm -hmm. can you talk more about it? And also your other co-founder, Piyush. Yes, so it was actually a very interesting story. Um, we, so Cameron and I were having mutual friends for a long time, actually. I knew my friends uh, from statistics and he knew them too. Um, but he, so he would, they would, they would tell me that they have this friend called Cameron who was working on um, this idea and always pitching, but I only heard about him from my friends. And then uh, eventually, Cameron reached out to them saying they were looking for a technologist. And then I happened to be the person they recommended. And then I met Cameron on, on for dinner because I think, um, so I'm also very social, social socially driven. I uh, actually had my own idea for um, another, uh, another startup that was kind of somewhat, somewhat similar. It still needed some mental health involvement. And when Cameron reached out to me, I was like, perfect. Let's work together and figure this out. So then Cameron reached out to me, uh, we met for dinner and I was on board. And then the very next morning, Cameron met Piyush at the gym. Uh, so within 12 hours, he actually he met both of us and then he got on board both of us because Cameron actually knew Piyush himself from a course he took together. So it's really interesting. Um, and Piyush and I have been best friends since basically year one. Um, we were both studying computer science. We both have different expertises, but um, we were really good friends for the entire time. And it just so happened that um, we, Piyush and I already knew each other for a long time. Cameron and Piyush knew each other. And then within 12 hours, Cameron met both me and Piyush and got us both on board. So that's a very uh, interesting uh, story, right? And it's always about the team. But what was the vetting process, right? Let's say, for example, you meet Cameron 
how are you sure that this is the guy i really want to partner with or how is cameron sure that hey i want to bet on ajit or piyush right so what is the vetting process like or how do you really decide hey this is who i really want to go work with yeah so um at the very beginning there really wasn't much of a vetting process of who was going to be on the team it was just who was the most interested right um so i joined and then i guess really for both of us it would be um to reputation of our friends so i knew cameron is this person who's always pitching always doing things that are um quite um beyond the scope of a student and i guess similarly uh, my friend uh my my mutual friend our mutual friend um told him about how much i've been doing on my own as well i've been i've worked multiple jobs i've had uh, competition experience as well and quite successful i'd say some someone successful uh so he knew about me through that and then similarly piyush i i also watched for him i know how much he's been working and how how hard he, uh, he's worked and how much he's done so really it was reputation and then we did go through a process where um a bunch of us bunch of us people that was interested were working together for a few months and uh after those few months it was very obvious that um Cameron me and Piyush were the ones that were most interested most involved and then we decided to go with us as the core members that's amazing right uh, this is actually a great vetting process too your past records and reputation is actually a great way to decide on who your team up is going to be and it's really awesome that all the three of you work really hard and you have mutual trust for each other that goes a long way and i think that's something all of us and all the students here can learn from cool and um, can you also talk us through some of the highs and lows in the journey in terms of hey okay you guys formed a team and it's the three of you and you have a couple of other people working with you as well uh, so was it always smooth or did you guys also fight with each other or how does that work uh yeah so it wasn't always smooth um there were some times where we did have some disputes and um all that but um i'd say yes those were frustrating those did take away from our time and we were um not really focusing on the on the real um value that we're adding to to the role which is you know the mental health solution right um so it wasn't really uh always a smooth experience we had ex- we had some disputes but i'd say overall the highs were that we were there to learn and we actually never really thought we'd been from the very beginning we just thought we didn't have a shot see what we can learn see what, how good idea is piyush wanted to join so we joined um but then we were interested in learning and through the process we had to learn a lot actually we had to change our ideas we changed our idea from a chatbot to a um facial recognition plus using using the gold standard of clinical testing um and that was a change that we that really only happened because of imagine cup and how much we were trying to push ourselves to um really innovate and uh that was experience of course of of from being mentored from the experiences and from how much we were learning so i'd say really the high was that our idea became so much more refined um we learned a lot that was what we came to do and somehow we won the champions of the world No that's awesome and uh, iterating through the idea and uh, changing things along the way is something i learned from this that's actually uh, really really cool right and um, what does it really take to win a cup how long did you guys work on it or what is the duration of that whole journey mm. yeah so we were working on this for um well actually long time uh, i think by the time we won the cup it was already the ninth month we were working together as a team about um and the imagine cup process was only 6 months actually about 6 6 7 months we were working beforehand as well and that was a long time i'd say but and also a lot of lot of commitment went to it um so what does it take to win a cup it really is just dedication commitment and knowing when to not knowing when to give up your idea and see how you can transform it um being willing to learn um and i guess also having a good idea from 
uh, of, of what you can actually want to change in the world. And for us, it was mental health. For anyone else, it could be anything else. But our idea was um, to help the world, really. Mm. Terrific. And um, what about your parents? Right? So once they knew that you won the cup, were they excited? And uh, what did they tell you? Yeah, so my parents were excited more than me even uh, about winning the cup. Uh, so when I told them that I actually didn't really tell them too much about the Imagine Cup. I didn't even tell them I was joining the cup. Uh, and they didn't know about the competition until we were chosen as the Asian finalists. So since then, however, they've been following me intently. Um, and then when we won the world champions, they couldn't believe it. They, even they didn't actually think I would win in the end, um, but they were beyond pleased. Um, they also helped me get an interview with Sun TV. So for Tamil audiences out there, they don't know what Sun TV is a very popular channel. I was actually on, their, on that channel. My parents helped me get that interview. Um, yeah, it was a, it was a very, very um, engaged. Yeah, I'm sure they're super pleased, right? So that's really awesome. And um, do you have brothers, sisters, or how is that? Yeah. Mm. yeah, so I have a younger brother. He studies in a, another university in Hong Kong. I'd say both of them are quite well known. Uh, I'm, I'm in Hong Kong University. My brother's in Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, HKU, HKUSD. Um, yeah, so HKUSD. Uh, he's, he's my younger brother. He study, he just finished year one. Um, and he's also like really hardworking. So he's yeah, studying engineering as well, but not, not computer science, mechanical engineering. Uh, that's awesome. And uh, yeah, the world needs mechanical engineers as well. In addition mm -hmm. to popular scientists. So it's awesome that he's studying mechanical engineering. And uh, yeah, and he has a great inspiration to look up to his brother, right, Ajit? So that's great. And uh, you also mentioned, or uh, when we were chatting uh, the last time, you talked about you took on internships and you worked mm -hmm. on it for like a year and things like that. Can you talk us through that process and how was it juggling between multiple things and working hard? Can you just talk through that? Yeah, so actually what happened was that I finished my third year of university. Um, but I was looking for jobs. I was actually particularly looking for one year internships because I obviously I did not know I was going to join Hollow at that time. Uh, I was just thinking about my career path. And I was, I looked at all the courses in year uh, and for I could take for year four. And I was like, okay, I don't know what I'm going to take. I don't know which courses look interesting to me. I need to learn and get industry experience. So I was actually, that's why I took my one year internship. So I took my gap year after year three to do an internship and during that process mid internship i happened to find cameron and then uh, i i got involved uh, i didn't think it'd be like that but it did and so then therefore i was working nine to six every morning um every afternoon and then at night i'd come work on polo and then eventually every public holiday every annual leave i had i would take purely for hollow. Um, it's what it took to win the competition. It's, uh, and also obviously I was um, very motivated to work on this. Helping the world of course is uh, socially driven. I'm, I'm really socially driven. And that was, that was a very good chance. And also in the end, my internship did, did pay off. I, I know exactly which course I'm gonna take now. I made up my mind. I know what type of in, uh, computer science, what, what um, can computer science can do and all the different um, possibilities. Uh, yeah, so it was, it was a very good hands-on experience, helped me learn, and then also taught me how to juggle so many things at once. And uh, yeah, it's a very, very difficult time, but I'd say very worth it. Absolutely, it's uh, great to know about your internships. And it's also social innovation, and uh, that makes a lot of difference. So what is next in the Hollow journey? I understand you guys have a company now and what is that you guys are working on next? Yeah, so after we won the Imagine Cup, obviously we're um, very interested in this idea and we made a company. Uh, our next goal is really to help, um, first of all, with NGOs, um, the frontline workers. Uh, we want to help them provide care to their um, to users and then um, who better to work with than NGOs that are directly working with them in the first place. And then we're looking into expanding our, our business to 
uh, many different fields, insurance, corporates, uh, and more importantly, and actually more to our more interest, more with our mission, and um, is that we are trying to make mental health more accessible and more um, talked about, more accepted, raise awareness. So for that, we're actually also going to build a community feature and making sure that communities can interact with each other and remove the stigma that mental health should, is a topic that should not be discussed or understood. We're going to change that. That's also on our roadmap. It's really awesome that uh, you're thinking and uh, working on building a community and uh, that makes a big difference with respect to both the product app and the business. So that's great. And uh, we have a lot of students here, right? So if in case you guys want to ask any questions to Ajit, you can uh, ask or type in your questions. We will save them uh, for the end. And uh, Ajit, can you talk about what books did you read as a kid? And what books are you reading right now? Mm. Yeah, so as a kid, I didn't really read too many books. I read my textbooks, if that counts. Um, I was always interested in learning and studying. Well, actually, I'd say I was learning, I was interested in studying. And then the more I studied, the more I realized that I was actually um, interested in learning instead. I see there's a difference between the two. Studying is when I'm just trying to understand, I'm trying to do an exam and pass my exams. Um, but learning for me is really when you're absorbing the information, making sense of it, being critical about the information. Um, so for me, learning is what I eventually developed as a habit from all the studying I did. And then I, I got around the habit of learning. And uh, now I, I am an avid reader, uh, I, but I don't really read from books too often. I, I actually have a very wide variety of sources because um, my, instead of reading books that take some time, I read articles that I can finish up faster and learn more in the same time and more sources. I read from articles, I listen to audiobooks because sometimes I, I'm multitasking. I watch YouTube videos, I watch TED Talks, I watch documentaries. Um, all of these are just my hobbies actually at this point because I, I, I'm always learning and trying to absorb information. They're a bit of a hobby because I'm learning something that's not computer science. Therefore, uh, I do consider that as a hobby sometimes as well. So I'm not actively learning computer science, I'm learning something else, yeah. Yeah, one thing I really realized talking to you is you're always learning and uh, yeah, so that's uh, terrific. And what does your typical day look like, Ajit? I mean, as a student, right? how do you ensure that uh, obviously all of us have distractions and as students, uh, you have even more distractions. Uh, so how do you ensure that you utilize your time effectively? Well, I like to, what I do is I, it's not necessarily the best way, but it worked for me was, I was always focused on um, figuring out what to, what to um, work on, what, oh, and a big portion of it was actually that I took on many projects um, more than I could handle, which is also a problem, but I didn't know how much I could handle, right? So I took on many projects. I During my studying, uh, during my, my university, even before my internship, I was doing a part-time job um, for 20 hours a week and while studying. And then I'd also go on to join competitions in the weekends, hackathons. Um, so these were many different things I was attending. Uh, I made myself committed and very busy. And then what I did was I made time from that, all my, all my busy schedule to have for friends. And for me, that was how I did it because I had a very busy schedule, but I know I also prioritize my friends a lot. And I didn't set aside time specifically for friends and all that, but when they wanted to hang out with me, I would always make the time. And that was how I stayed motivated was whenever, and I always reached out to them every now and then and just said, hi. But, and then they'd tell me, oh, we have a plan. I'd find as much as possible time to help with them. And that way I'd be motivated. But anyway, I still have my commitments always eating at me, making sure I'm working. Definitely. And uh, keeping yourself busy is an easy way to stop uh, distraction. And that's yeah. something uh, I learned from whatever you said. So that's fantastic, right? 
And uh, you have also taken part or won or been a finalist in a lot of other competitions, right? So, like for example, you were a finalist in the Global Legal Hackathon uh, competition, and you traveled to New York uh, for the same. And you were also a recipient uh, of an experiential learning projects uh, and all that. So, can you talk about some of the other uh, uh, competitions you took part in and some of the other awards you won? Yeah, so um, from during my university life, um, the main competition that really got me any awards was the Global Legal Hackathon and the Imagine Cup. Uh, the Global Legal Hackathon was where um, after a couple of competitions, I, I joined many hackathons already. Um, then um, one of my one of the ideas finally got me to the world finals. Uh, so that was a year before Imagine Cup, actually. So just one year before Imagine Cup, I was already in a different competition in the World Finals as well. We didn't win that one, but I got to travel to New York, which we should have been able to travel to Seattle this year, but because of the virus, um, we didn't. So at least I got my chance to travel to New York last year. Still America. Uh, that was, um, for me, a really amazing trip. It was my first solo trip. Uh, in a different continent even. Um, and um, apart from that, of course, my, my during my schooling years, I, I'd worked really hard and I did achieve many awards from there too. But during my university life, I think the biggest two were really just the Imagine Cup and the, World, and the Global Legal Hackathon. Fantastic, it's really motivating. So how do you keep yourself updated? You talked about learning, but what are one, of the, one or two things you think that every student needs to learn or how do they update their skill sets? Mm. Um, learning how to learn is a big skill. I think there's many different learning forms. There's many different um, um, sources as well. So you can you can learn actively. You can learn by um, being taught in a lecture. Um, you can you can find what works for you. There's so many different ways to learn, especially on the internet. Um, there is literally endless sources of learning. Um, and learning how to learn is because you don't necessarily know how to search for the right terms in Google. I use Google a lot. I learned what types of phrases get me the results I want. Uh, I've learned um, what types of diagrams I should be looking for. Uh, I, I learn visually sometimes as well. So then I learned different types of repre like visual representations so I know like sometimes charts are good, at, like um, bar charts are a good idea. Sometimes like, like a matrix is a good idea um, to learn. And, and I look up all these different types of source, diagrams or sources and I, I search for them. And then I'm like, oh, okay, now I have a better understanding of what's going on. So I learned all these tips basically by reading so much that eventually I had to pick up all these skills. I'm like, okay, I want to find this. I didn't know where to look, but because I learned so much, I read so much that eventually I, was like, I started making patterns in my own head that, oh, if I wanna look for, for this thing, I should probably search for a matrix type of chart that will explain this concept very well in a visual way. Um, stuff like that for me was a very, very important. And there's so many tools on the internet. I don't think university is really the only way you can learn. Um, in fact, for me, it was, if I followed the university path only, I wouldn't have been where I am. Um, there's many ways to learn. And also for another way is that my, because, I, because I, again, I read so much, I, I have so many curated sources that all my, whatever the smart, intelligent platforms, they always feed me the ones that I want to learn. <laughs> so. Oh, fantastic. And I'm sure, I mean, everybody agrees that we are living through a digital uh, revolution right now and it makes it a level playing field for everybody. So that's uh, terrific. So learning is one thing and learning how to learn is actually a great goal. And uh, how do you apply the learning at work? Right? So can you talk about that? Let's say you learn a lot of things, but how do you know that, hey, okay, let me apply. Do you apply your learning at work or can you talk about that? Yeah, so I don't really think about applying it at work too often. I learn for the sake of learning most of the time, but um, I do reflect a lot. What I do, I guess, where how I figure out how to apply it is that when I have a problem, I tend to reflect a lot, and I, I call upon different sources of information in my head, 
I'm trying to like, okay. Um, basically, I just reflect. I think a lot before I act sometimes. Uh, and sometimes I think too much, but sometimes I think just enough to understand what I really need to be doing right now. Um, so for me, it's just about reflecting and um, making sure that uh, all the information in my head makes sense. Yeah. Great. So, I mean, there are a lot of students uh, watching this and they are also going to be watching this on YouTube. Uh, so what advice would you have for students watching this or young budding entrepreneurs out there? What would you advise? Oh, so um, depending on your background, but um, if you're a software engineer or a technical person like I am, uh, I would go the path of learning if you're going to become like a CTO, um, learning your technology stack and relevant skills for that is probably the best option. Now there's a lot of options by the way nowadays. Um, a software engineer can involve um, front end, back end, DevOps, data engineers, um, machine learning engineers, uh, cloud specialists, so on and so forth. I'd say just focus on the most tangible results for now. So in my in this case would be a front end. Um, focus on a back end that can, can give you the information you need. Um, and start with that first. So before you become an entrepreneur, really, I if you become a CTO like I am, go with that approach. And then when you're ready to be when you when you when you are able to make something and you have a team that is willing to work with you, then you learn entrepreneurship. You learn about learning, uh, you learn about this entrepreneurship, you learn about businesses, market sense, and hopefully your co-founder CEO will help you on this path, like for me, uh, happened to me. And um, in that case, just continue on your path and, and continue learning. Cool, awesome. So what is one thing you learned from Cameron and Piyush? Can you talk about that? Yeah, so for my our team, Cameron brought a very business-minded perspective and a very, um, he knew how to pitch, he knew how to market it. Um, and in also Piyush brought a very data-oriented perspective. Uh, he he knew what um, was lacking in our solutions at most times, and then he helped innovate as well. I was able to build everything. Um, so front end, back end were my specialties. I was able to build. I also, of course, um, worked with designers and everything for this to happen. Um, but so um, what Cameron and Piyush really taught me is that there are so many perspectives and you really should respect everything. Data is one thing I did not realize is so, so um, can be very difficult. I learned from Piyush and then Cameron taught me about pitching investors, business, and um, really what you should be thinking. I also learned one big thing was Inventing is when you're making technology. Innovation is when you when you apply that um, that technology or something or not even a new technology, just making a good business model for it and making it succeed in the world. That's innovation. If you can make it succeed in the world, if you can, inventing is just when you make new technology. It's not necessarily innovation. Innovation is really applying that skill set and making a business model out of it and making it apply, work in the real world. Really well said, right? So you're inventing something, you're innovating something, but it's not so much fun until people use it. And that's yeah. exactly where you guys are headed, right? So big congratulations uh, to you. I really enjoyed this chat. And again, a big kudos to you, Ajit. And I think a lot of students here have learned a lot and I'm sure they learn a lot more. And if there's one thing I got from this is, hey, keep learning. And that makes a big difference. And we have a lot of questions coming in as well. So yep. let me just bring on Strija and uh, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Bradley, uh, for the for the uh, interesting session like which you had, and thank you so much for your time for coming down to our uh, web series for giving the uh, interesting questions. I hope like that will be benefited for all the participants as well. So we got to know uh, more about um, Ajit, the other side of Ajit and know how he gets equipped in terms of learning and all other steps. So before going, jumping into the audience questions, I, I do have like uh, you know, some of the questions like uh, from the community, like if you address that, that would be beneficial for everyone. Okay? 
So uh, what what would be the piece of advice uh, for any student who's going to you're going to give for who's going to enroll for the Imagine Cup or any other competition that matters? So how to prepare themselves? Or what is the zeal they want to have? You no. Know? So, so what is the main core like you think, uh, Ajit? Yeah. Um, be firm on your idea. I'd say most competitions, um, unless it's very technical, don't um, look at your techn technology as on the same level as the idea. If you have a better idea, then the more likely you are to win. Something I've experienced along the way was that, um, and technology doesn't always necessarily win the competition, um, but of course it's important. And knowing that is important, but um, know the rules of the competition, focus on the right places, think about how to really go above and beyond. In our case for Hollow, what we did was we noticed that um, phones were the one assumption you can make about everyone. Smartphones are something that everyone has. However, if you want to let like heart rate, we can't understand, uh, we can't uh, um, necessarily rely on people having smartwatches for reference. Even I don't have an Apple watch or a smartwatch. And if, um, if you think about other communities, most likely they're not also going to have one as well. What they will have, however, is a smartphone. And that was how we made it accessible. So that was how we adhered to the rules of Imagine Cup and we made it more accessible. Was one big reason was that because we were thinking what actually makes accessible. And for us, it was people have smartphones, not necessarily anything else. So it's made technology based around that. Yeah, thank you. So um, before jumping into the another question, and um, so guys, like if you have any questions, please use the chat panel or the Q and A section in the bottom panel of your Zoom. Okay. Okay. So jumping on to the next question. You know? So as I said before, like uh, there are a lot of social problems which prevails in the society. Okay. So uh, and why you guys like you no know, particularly like you took a mental health problem. So what triggered you or your team? to take up the problem and to find a solution for it. Hmm. So actually what happened was Cameron was working on this idea um, during his coursework in university. And he was actually working on this for two years. Um, but uh, why he chose mental health was because it was dear to him. Uh, he lost his friend um, to depression. And, uh, and, uh, and this idea was basically, he was thinking what could have helped instead was more accessible mental health care. And then he was working on that. And then um, for the next two years, he was working alone until he realized he wants to take more of a technology spin on it. And then he recruited me and Piyush. Um, so why mental health is not just, it's just because that was the idea that was most closest to our hearts at that time. Um, would we stick with mental health only? Not really. We, we all of us, um, both uh, Cameron and I and everyone. So we're all interested in, um, being serial social entrepreneurs, I know I will go on to start even more companies that are socially driven as well. Uh, I don't plan on just stopping mental health. So if it's why mental health in particular is because that was the one I was closer to our heart, but it won't stop here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, so no, like, uh, so let's answer for one question from the audience friends. Okay. So it is a question from uh, Subham. Uh, can you please explain what exactly facial recognition do in Holo? Yeah, so um, we detect heart rate, sleep quality, uh, your stress levels, emotions. Um, and we do this because um, we want to make it easy to assess you and also to remove the bias of self-reporting because chances are you do not know what... Um, exactly you're going through and all the um and what exactly is going on so we uh, want to remove the bias of self-reporting and that's why we're using facial recognition um yeah so that's what we do we are trying to remove the self-reporting bias by using facial recognition and helping you identify what is um what's going on and then if we really if you think you're if you think you're um uh, a quite a uh, severe, severe case, we will connect you to professionals uh, in the mental health industry and in in community around you. Perfect. 
Okay, so um, no, like when you talk about the mental health issues, all the problems, you know, like there are a lot of classification inside it. Okay, so it can be anxiety or a depression or OCD or ADHD, and it goes on, right? Mm -hmm. So, in what way, like uh, the whole of fill the gap, and how does it classify it? Yes. Yeah, so now, one big distinction is that we are not um, making the decision first and uh, firmly. We are suggesting. Uh, we suggest that you might have this and this, and um, we are focusing on only being able to detect depression and anxiety first. But um, when we move on to other um, other possible uh, reasons for um, mental health problems, we will move on beyond depression and, and anxiety. But right now, we're focusing on that those two. So yeah, that, that's um, of course we understand it's a very exhaustive, it's a very very long list of what can be. The reason, but um, we are focusing on those two first, and then moving on to understand as we get more data. So this is a question from the audience, okay, JB. So if you were to start learning again, how would you start? Yeah. So actually, I would do whatever I end up doing, but on a faster pace, uh, in a more um, focused way. Um, is I would learn what, I, what I'm actually quite skilled at right now is front end, back end, and DevOps. Those are the three main skills I'm focusing on. So for that, actually, I know, um, I know JavaScript for front end. I'm very focused on that. I know Python and Java for back end. And for DevOps, I know Docker, Kubernetes. Um, those are all stuff I learned. Um, why did I learn them is because I looked at the trends of what are the most popular languages and I, I chose from there. Uh, and I also, of course, chose the ones I liked and thought had the most value. If actually, I wouldn't even learn Java anymore. I would learn Kotlin instead of Java. And um, maybe if you want to make an iOS app, you might want to learn Swift. But the three main skills is that you have to be able to show the user something as front end. That's, I guess, first and foremost. Um, and then having a back end to sub supplement, having a DevOps to be able to deploy. Um, of course, there's many other things you could learn, but I, I'd say they're all supplementary and are more specialized. And maybe in this day and age, you might want someone to learn data engineering, but I wouldn't learn that until, at least until I finish front and back end. Then I'll learn data engineering and I'll learn other things, but being able to show tangible results first as a, as a student is very important. So Ajit, I have a follow-up question there, actually. Mm -hmm. So you talk about a lot of great technology, right? So you talk about DevOps, you talk about Docker, and a lot of other things. So it's awesome that you have exposure to all these uh, technologies. But not all students have exposure, right? So like, for example, let's say there's somebody who's just finishing his 12th grade, and uh, they're getting into college, and uh, maybe they're in their uh, senior year or sophomore year or whatever that is, right? So how do they get exposed, right? Mm. So what do you do to get it? See, I mean, it's, it's awesome that, hey, you've gone to the Imagine Cup, you have all this exposure, great. But not all students have this exposure. Mm. So how do they get exposed? It's honestly, there's so much content online. You can find everything online. Um, there's many YouTubers about it. Um, I particularly love the pathway of going through Udemy. I would buy courses upon courses, but if you want to be even more accessible, if you don't have um, that much money to spend on courses, just learn from YouTube um, and don't focus too much on who's a teacher too much. Just learn what you can. Keep making things that you think are cool from front end first. I, of course, I focus on front end because you can show people this is what I'm working on. It's the most tangible results. And then learn from YouTube. And then learn back end again. You can learn from YouTube, or I, I learned almost everything from Udemy. Uh, yeah, but there's so much content online that uh, on so many sources that you can learn everything for free actually. Oh, and a very big um, uh, a source that you might want to be interested in is something called the Open Source uh, University for Computer Science. Uh, it's on GitHub. And there's an entire degree basically, but all for free and open source. There's, there's actually an entire open source university out there. And you can also look up something called Awesome. 
uh, on GitHub. It's a very popular um, type of format where they make a list of all the important technologies and all the important resources you can go from. You can scroll through those awesome lists. You can scroll through the open source university. There's so many, there's so many ways you can learn. Yeah. Cool. And uh, another question, how do you choose your friends? Ah, uh, yes. Um, personally, I don't think I choose my friends, more so who I continue to hang out with. I'm very extroverted by nature. So it's quite different for me, but um, how I, what happens is that I talk to a lot of people, but then who I continue to be friends with is really, I guess, a thing. I noticed that for me, it's when I'm able to push myself further and, or at least they, they, they're either very funny, they have good sense of humor, therefore I can keep myself grounded. I, I'm, I don't have to think too much about like, oh, what am I working on with them? Or also I choose friends based on um, what I'm professionally working on. So I'm working on this thing and then they are interested and I choose friends that, that way too. Um, just people similar to me, but uh, again, it's always different for everyone else. For me, my defin definition of success was very academic and very um, software engineering based. Uh, it could be different for everyone else. Sports, again, who you continue to hang out with and who gives you um, happiness and yeah. Well, that's awesome, Ajit. Thank you. I think there are more questions coming on from the audience, so I'm just going to pass it on to the street. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Gaiti. Okay, so uh, now uh, even I have this question, and this is a question from uh, Gandhi Murugan, uh, Arumugam. Okay, Gandhi Arumugam. So, what is the role of machine learning in your Holo solution, and what are the, hmm. whole, I mean, the machine learning techniques you have been using in the Holo product? Yes, yeah, so. Um, the role of machine learning is to make it more personalized um, and detect things that uh, otherwise would be edge cases and they would be missed. Um, we try to cater it around your um, your behaviors, your user your usage patterns, um, your facial recognitions, and all that. Um, really, it's just to provide a more personalized care. Um, is that do we have to use machine learning? Not necessarily. We can also go data science and data um, analysis to get the same information to the most ex to similar extent, but it falls short because then we're um, generalizing and we don't have enough understanding for personalization. And that's where machine learning comes in for us. Perfect, yeah, thank you. And uh, this is a question from the anonymous attendee. And what, what are your career plans for the future? Perhaps going full-time on Holo after graduating? Or do you have any other plans? Um, yeah, so uh, I'm confirmed full-time on Holo after graduating. Uh, I'm already full-time, actually, even while being a student. Um, I'm, yeah, so it's already, it's already basically confirmed. I'm a full-time um, co-founder in Holo. And after this, of course, it'll be starting more companies. I don't see myself being able to stop um, from pursuing a more socially driven entrepreneur path. I wanna be a serial social entrepreneur. So that's going to be the, the trend for some time. Okay. So um, there are most of the mental health problems caused only by the society or the circumstances we create, right? So how Holo, uh, no, um, planning to bring up the remedies to it? Like, do you have any other plans for it? Hmm. Um, so yes, it is only caused by um, the society and people around you, but that's actually why we're here. Um, if you have a platform that you can easily access and you can talk about with your friends as well. That's where the community feature we're trying to build is. Um, we're, that's where we're existing. But in the meantime, of course, there has to be other solutions, right? Um, apart from just hollow. So in that case, I'd say is you yourself should be the change you need to see in the world. Um, you can start learning about mental health. I'd actually suggest you to use go professional care from the very beginning. I don't think, I think all of us do not know enough about how to take care of our mental health. 
and um, the stigma around seeing a professional for managing your mental health is very, very, very um, detrimental to everyone. I don't think you know how to take care of yourself properly because frankly speaking, we're not taught. Um, that's where professionals come in. And so if you have the resources, please go see a professional. Uh, that's number one. Uh, second is of course, if you can't go and see a professional for whatever reason, then make yourself more aware the mental health exists, acknowledge the problem, um, see what the community is saying. There's so many again, resources online, but um, yeah, so, but then, and just talking about it with your friends, see if you can bring up the conversation. See if you can tell them, hey, I'm actually being stressed right now. I'm being stressed, I'm um, not sleeping. One major issue you might not even know you're having is chronic stress perhaps, um, and, or when you're anxious, maybe you're burnt out. Actually for me, I happen to figure out for myself that when I'm burnt out, I'm not really enjoying the work I'm doing. And that's how I know I'm burnt out. But there's so many different things again, and that's why talking is really the best solution and talking to a professional is even better. Yeah. Yeah. So what are the, and this is another question from the audience. So what are the difference between Halo and the other mental apps already established in the market? Yeah. So if you look at Headspace or Calm, those are, I guess, the most prominent examples, right? That are targeted towards meditation and, um, and mental health in a sense. Um, there are also other apps like Vobot, Uper, um, that also do something similar. They're trying to use um, psychological uh, psychology, like best standards. Um, they're all good solutions. I'd say they would work for the short term, but where they're really lacking is um, their connection to professionals. Um, we, and also of course, self-reporting. They, they rely on you knowing for yourself what the problem is. We don't assume that. We can, we can ask you to tell us, but we also don't assume that you know what your problem really is because most of the time we don't. And then we also connect you to mental health professionals directly. Um, if, you, if, you, if, you see, if you think that you need the help, we don't hesitate to connect you to mental health professionals. Something I think most of these apps are lacking is because they're very self-care driven. And, and that's, only one separate, that's only one part of the um, solution. So uh, when you take the Holo app, like, you know, so I gone through the description and all of this stuff, like it says like youth mental problems. So do you have any other plans for uh, addressing the elderly mental problems? Mm. Um, elderly mental health problems are kind of, kind of different. Um, they're focused on different things, but um, generally, of course, it's still depression and anxiety are two of the probably main sources of the mental health problems. Um, you'll have difficulties with understanding the wrinkles on their faces. So our algorithms will have to change a bit. You need to get more data for that to understand the, um, the different facial recognition. But also the most um, important part is that um, you need to also change the user experience and user journey. The other layers are, are not necessarily as um, open to technology and to cater for that as well. So uh, we, we got another question from the audience. In your opinion, what is the primary goal of a startup and uh, how important is generating profit for Holo? Mm. A startup is there to make money, uh, first and foremost. Um, we are, if you're a company, you're, you're uh, have to make a profit. You have to think about how to be sustainable. But um, that's where I guess it differs because um, and generally, of course, you're making money by providing a service. So in essence, you're most likely providing something of value to other people. That's what they're paying for you. But of course, money is at the end, uh, the most important thing. Um, that's where I guess I also like to say I'm a social entrepreneur instead, where we don't just look at the money side of things. We also look at the social impact. We actually weigh it equally in our in our case. Um, we weigh the social and the um, the finance on equal perspective. Um, how important is generating profit for Hollow? Of course, very important. We had to generate profit. If we can't help ourselves and make continue to earn money, 
and be sustainable, we can't help you long term. Um, so making money, money is of course um, very important for us. We um, we value being able to generate more money to actually make our services better. Therefore, you'll pay for us. Okay. So when when can we expect Holo to be launched to the market? Yes. So um, we're doing a lot of um, closed betas right now. Um, we're doing data collection and all that. We're expecting Holo to be launched in the market around um, by end of this year around 2020 and 2021. Um, why we need so long is because it's, it, of course, is a very important solution and also can be quite important to your lives. Uh, and we want to make sure it's as accurate as possible. So we're doing tests first beforehand. We are doing that actively right now. But until then, we need to make sure we're actually able to uh, help you uh, help you properly. So uh, now, like, uh, like how many members are in your team, and uh, what is your role uh, in Holo product? Yes, so we have a few members on our team right now, uh, not too many, less than five actually, but we're at, we're at hiring. We are looking for new talent. Um, my role is now product management, and of course, building the front end, back end, and the main product really. Um, so I'm actually very product focused. Of course, I'm also involved with investing investors and everything, but that's for Hall, uh, that's where Cameron shines. Um, yeah, so we're we're still looking for more talent. We don't expect to succeed with just five people, but we're yeah we're still hiring. Perfect. So um, so I would like to. Um, have a, I mean, the final note from you, like, you know, so, so there are a lot of students watching out here and uh, what is your final piece of advice for them in their career to prosper or to take up entrepreneurship as their um, role? Um, yeah. Oh, also, by the way, there's also one more question after this on the Q&A. Um, so what I would tell other students to do is, um, Really focus on your definition of success. Um, don't worry about what I did. Don't worry about what other people did. Um, your definition of success is completely different from mine. Um, hopefully, it's a. Hopefully, you're making an impact in the world. Oh, actually, one more important, one more important message, is um, software engineering or this industry in general needs more diverse perspectives. Um, we mental health, of course, is one very important perspective that we brought. Um, there are many more perspectives that we couldn't bring necessarily, even as much as I want to be a social entrepreneur, I don't know, I have all the ideas. We need more people to join. I know, especially because if you're minorities or you're uh, underprivileged, it'll be even harder for you to succeed. But um, I also want you to know that you are needed. Um, we do need your opinions and um, please succeed. Um, try your best to succeed despite the challenges because the world needs more perspectives. So uh, I'm honestly rooting for you to succeed um, because the world needs it. Cool, thank you. And uh, we have a question, like if a big company were to offer you to buy out for say 30 million, would you take it? And what will be your team decision on it? Personally, 30 million is too small. <laughs> it's too small right now uh, for me. But of course, um, you decide, you think about it, but for me, it's too small. I honestly believe that if we if we go in the right direction, we continue on our path, we'd be huge. Um, so no, uh, and also it also depends on the person. It depends on the company who's what's their intention. If um, if I really think that the company could really take it better, and I don't think I can sell for more than thirty million, then sure. I, I, but I most likely think that um, no matter who it is, most people in general are just not equipped enough to handle mental health properly. Maybe let's say Google or whatever, maybe they had the best chance, but I trust myself. I, I know that I'm very devoted. And as long as I have the right training and I have the right people with me that help me in my journey, I'll be able to make it um, without the big company to take over. And I, I'm not really in it for the money completely. I'm in it for the helping people. And yes, I want to make money as a startup, but as a company, but I don't want it at the expense of losing the impact I'll be making. 
Okay. So, uh, how do you hire the right people? And have you hired software engineers on your team of five, or have it? Mm. So, what we did in the very beginning is that um, when it's just us, a small co-founders, um, we already defined culture. That's the first thing we did. One of the first things we did for before hiring, I already knew what kind of culture I wanted. We already knew what kind of um, rituals we'd be doing to make sure everyone's on track and how we'll be working as a team. We're working on cross-functional teams. Our culture is that we are um, big on mental health and well-being, and we understand that most people are not able to necessarily wake up so early. So we made it to 10.30 instead of nine o'clock um, starting hours, um, stuff like that. We, we know people need help. Therefore, we have uh, a confirmed habit of um, having meetings every stand up every morning to confirm, um, to, to um, check in on everyone, ask them what they're thinking. Um, so we have all these cultures in place beforehand, before hiring. And then when we hire, um, we make sure to fit the culture that we've already defined. Talent is of course a big thing, but more importantly, the culture was already defined and therefore we need to make sure that they can stick to that as well. Perfect, okay. Thank you so much, Ajit. Like, um, I believe like, um, they have like a lot of questions. Like if you have any questions, probably you can just send it across to me. Like I'll compile it and I'll send it across to Ajit. And I would say like, you know, it was a, a very special session and, uh, and we got like students joined the session and they would have gotten inspiration through the session. And uh, thank you so much for your time for joining us. And thank you, Patrick, for uh, joining us for this session. And uh, have a great weekend. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you.